the English Lake District, the most spectacular area in the country. The mountains tumble down to the sea and form a mighty backdrop to one of Britain's great railway journeys. Carried along by modern sprinters, there's always plenty to see. Boats and steamers ply the lakes, branch lines have been reopened for steam trains, and the scenery is always superb. Our journey forms a circuit around Cumbria and the Lake District. This popular tourist area is bordered by the West Coast Main Line, on which Carnforth Station was developed as a meeting point of the London and North Western, the Midland and the Furness Railways. In 1942, Italian prisoners of war built a motive power depot here. It closed in 1968, but the junction is still very busy with freight. With the closure of the depot, a group of enthusiasts took over the site and developed it into Steamtown Carnforth. The coaling and ash plants are now the only surviving examples in Britain and there's plenty of space to display mainline locomotives. There's also a three quarter mile long demonstration line. David is an 040 industrial saddle tank built by Andrew Barclay in 1953 for the iron ore mines at Miller. In contrast, there is a parallel 15-inch gauge line. George V was built by the model makers Bassett Loke in 1911. From Carnforth, the main line heads north to Oxenholm, junction for the branch line to Windermere. In steam days, Oxenholm provided the banking engines for traffic on the steep grey rig bank. The main line is now served by class 86 and 87 electric locomotives, which can travel up to 110 miles per hour. Diesel sprinters operate the line to Windermere, 
which was built by the Kendall and Windermere Railway in 1846. first stop is at Kendall, the old grey town, which dates from the bloody days of border warfare. The castle is a reminder of those times. It was strengthened after a particularly terrible massacre by Duncan, Earl of Fife, who raided from Scotland. Catherine Parr, the last of Henry VIII's six wives, was born in the castle. streets lead down to the parish church of the Holy and Undivided Trinity. First recorded in the Doomsday Survey of 1086, the present church is 13th century, though the cross in the churchyard hints at an older Celtic heritage. This is one of the largest churches in the country. Kendall's market charter dates from 1189. Buildings are grouped around yards with narrow alleys, which once provided security from attack. The Kentmere Valley is served by a station at Staveley. Kent tumbles down from the long ridges of the High Street Range, and the small village of Kentmere is an ideal starting point for those who wish to explore. At the end of the line is Windermere and England's largest lake. The English Lake District was created from a huge mountain dome pushed up from ancient tropical seas. Ice Age glaciers then sculpted the landscape, which is now protected by Britain's largest national park. The Windermere Steamboat Museum houses a unique collection of Victorian and Edwardian steam launches. All are afloat, in working order, and run under steam from time to time. The museum 
was opened in 1977 by the Prince of Wales. Dolly, built in 1850, was rescued from the lake bed. She is the oldest mechanically propelled boat in the world. Steam launch Kitty Wake was built in 1898 for William Grimble, a prosperous brewer. Such launches were very fashionable among the Victorian elite who built their elegant homes on the shores of the lake. The launch is fueled with wood and is driven by a Sissons triple expansion engine. Bowness is a popular town, dating back to the Vikings. Poets and artists have been coming to the lakes for hundreds of years. Among them, Charles Dickens, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Arthur Ransom, and Beatrix Potter. From the pier at Bowness, steamers regularly cruise the full length of Lake Windermere to Ambleside and to Lakeside. During their heyday, the lake steamers were controlled by the Furness Railway. The motor vessel Turn was built in 1891 and is the oldest on the lake. She was converted to diesel in 1956. Ambleside has always been a market town, but now its slate houses and narrow streets cater for a large number of visitors. <laughs> Tumbling through the town is Stop Gill, which passes beneath the tiny bridge house. Back on the steamer, we head south for Lakeside and the railboat terminus built for the arrival of the Furness Railway in 1869. Lakeside and Haverthwaite Railway is a restored branch line of the old Furness Railway, which carried iron ore from Furness and tourists into the Lake District. Kopernob is the only locomotive to have survived from the opening of the railway in 1846 and is now preserved at York. Here on the Lakeside and Haverthwaite Railway, we've got three and a half miles of track from Lakeside to Haverthwaite. We run six trains a day, seven trains a day in the peak season. The railway was opened in 1972 by a private company. It had been closed for a number of years then, and we've been running ever since then. Repulse is an 060 industrial saddle tank. Built by Hunslet in 1950, she spent most of her working life at a colliery near Manchester. Thank <laughs> you. 
Halfway along the line is the quiet riverside hamlet of Newby Bridge. Railway's centre of operations is at Harrisweight. Here, the saddle tank takes on water and runs round a train. Passengers have a few minutes to look at the railway's collection of locomotives and rolling stock before the return to Lakeside. at Carnforth, we depart for Arnside and Grange on the Cumbrian coastline. The line was built in installments by several different railway companies. The impressive viaduct over the Kent at Arnside was built by James Brownlees, the chief engineer of the Alverston and Lancaster Railway. are now dominated by the great expanse of Morecambe Bay, where hundreds of square miles of sand are exposed at low tide. Here, at Grangeover Sands, the Furness Railway created a small and sheltered seaside resort.
Despite the quicksand and fast tide, there have been low tide paths across the bay since medieval times, saving many miles of long detours. The sands are famous for bird life, while cockles, mussels and shrimps are local delicacies. Grange was optimistically promoted as the Bournemouth of the North. Early development plans were never realized, but the shops and ornamental gardens have retained a charm and timelessness from an earlier era. Inland, there's a pretty village of Cartmel. The village is clustered around the market square with its small shops and priory gatehouse. Cardinal Priory was built by Augustinian monks in the late 12th century. It's one of the country's few remaining monastic churches. Further down the peninsula, the line passes through Kent's Bank and Cock. Humphrey Head is a limestone crag which juts out into Morecambe Bay. This rocky promontory is a site of special scientific interest and the views from its windswept summit are truly magnificent. Not far from the station at Cark is Holker Hall, the 16th century stately home and gardens of the Cavendish family are open to the public. The hall is also home to the Lakeland Motor Museum, a fascinating display of classic and vintage cars and motorcycles, including a steam car and a land speed record breaker. The museum has built up over 100 main exhibits from great marks such as the Gonda, Buick, Bentley, and Cadillac. This Dennis fire engine was built in 1914. As well as the vehicles, there's also a wonderful collection of automobilia.
from Cark, the line continues west over the Leven Estuary to Alveston. The Leven Viaduct repeats the excitement of the Kent crossing. This is an even longer structure, and as winds have a tendency to funnel up the estuary, there's a 30 mile per hour speed restriction. To the south, the eye is drawn to Chapel Island. Only one and a half miles long, the Alveston Canal is Britain's shortest. It was built in 1795 when the shifting sands silted up the original harbour and gave Alveston another century as a major port. The lock was sealed off in the Second World War and from then on it was the railway which connected Alveston to the outside world. Alveston was once the terminus of the branch line to Lakeside. It is still one of England's most impressive small town stations, thanks to Paley and Austin's wonderful Italianate architecture. Alveston is a mixture of old and new, with the cobbled streets of the old town centered on the market square. The name derives from a Saxon called Elf, but the town's most famous son was Stan Laurel. Welcome to the Long and Hardy Museum. This museum is a tribute to two men who came from different worlds. Long and Hardy were to meet purely by chance on the Hal Roach studio set. Stan, of course, the thin one, Arthur Stanley Jefferson, was born here in Alveston on June the 16th, 1890. His partner, Oliver Hardy, was born in Georgia, in the deep south of America, on the 18th of January, 1892. They came together and made a wonderful career with over 105 films. An amazing partnership, and it's all uh, documented here in great detail uh, in, in the museum. Another attraction for visitors is the Heron Glass Factory, where molten glass is transformed into wonderful works of art. The master maker was trained by the Venetians, and the glass workers follow a style which is centuries old. Beyond Alveston, the line climbs steeply towards Dalton and Barrow in Furness. Beneath the summit at Lindell, the village of Great Erswick is clustered around its tarn. Its church dates from the 13th century. Furness Abbey was built by the Cistercian monks in 1147. During the period of Norman domination, the abbey controlled vast tracts of land and developed the local mining and woolen industries. It was one of the most wealthy and important in Britain, and second only to Fountains Abbey. Like so many others, it was destroyed by Henry VIII, but the ruins are now protected by 
my English heritage. There's also a museum with some fine examples of stonework from the Abbey. The line north of Barrow is part of the original Furness Railway, which opened in 1846. Just four years later, the discovery of enormous deposits of hematite, or iron ore, made the Furness Railway Company one of the most prosperous of its time. The Furness Railway arrived in Foxfield in 1848. Just a year later, a branch line to Coniston was opened to serve the copper mines there. The line closed in 1962, the same year as Donald Campbell's ill-fated water speed record on Lake Coniston. Today, the old junction at Foxfield serves Broughton in Furness, a pleasant little 18th century market town. The line now turns south crossing Duddon Sands and heads out over Millam Marsh. The small town of Millam was made prosperous by mining. In the 19th century, it had the largest and busiest iron mines in Britain. Millam's old station building has been developed into a craft centre where dozens of local skills and crafts are displayed, including painting, carving and furniture restoration. The town itself has many fine Victorian buildings, but the last of the ironworks was closed in 1968. Nature is reclaiming the slag heaps and hot barrow flooded ore mines now attract wildfowl. In the town, the mighty mass of Black Coombe dominates the skyline. Wild moorland rises almost 2,000 feet, giving plenty of scope for walkers. About 5,000 years ago, a Swinside stone circle was built on the hill's northern flanks. Early farmers needed to calculate the seasons, and this symmetrical circle of 50 stones may well have been an early form of calendar. From Millam, the railway heads north, passing the windmills at Sylcroft before entering the National Park. Yeah. 
Soon we approach Ravenglass and the junction with the Ravenglass and Eskdale Railway. But first, there's another impressive viaduct over the River Esk. Ravenglass itself is a small village which claims to be a town, having had a market charter ever since 1208. Once this was a major port, but the last ore was shipped from its rapidly silting harbour in the 1880s. Today a sandbar prevents access by anything other than small craft, and the saltings and dunes have become a bird sanctuary. Alongside the British Rail Station is the terminus of the Ravenglass and Eskdale Railway. Built in 1875, the railway was originally a three-foot gauge line, which carried iron ore and later passengers and granite from the Nab Gill mines near Boot. In 1915, the famous model engineer W.J. Bassett Loke rescued the line from closure and relayed it to a gauge of 15 inches. Since 1961, the railway has been operated as a tourist line by the Ravenglass and Eskdale Railway Preservation Society. River Ert is the railway's oldest engine. This 082 tender locomotive was built by Sir Arthur Haywood in 1894 and rebuilt at Ravenglass in 1927. Northern Rock is a 262 tender locomotive built in the Ravenglass and Eskdale's own workshops in 1976. It's thought to be the most powerful 15-inch gauge locomotive in the world. In the running shed, two more locomotives are prepared for the day's duties. Making up her train is River Might, a 1966 Clarkson 282. A diesel hauled arrival clears the section to Might Side Loop, leaving the road clear for River Might to depart. The first stop on the line is the historic Munkester Mill. Flour has been milled here since 1455. The overshot water wheel has been restored and the mill is now open to the public. Above the mill is the impressive stately home of Munkester Castle. The Pennington family have lived here ever since 1208 when the land was granted to us by King John. The oldest bit of the castle you can now see dates from 1325 and the Penningtons had to build a castle to protect themselves from the border raids from Scotland. There's a lovely formal walk called the Terrace laid out in 1780 by the first Lord Munkester 
where you could do the Grand Promenade. And it looks out over the magical valley of Estale. And the view from there was described by John Ruskin as a gateway to paradise. King Edward VII, when he stayed here, described the view from the front of the castle as the finest view in Europe. A more recent addition to the Monkester's attractions is the superb Al Centre. And the Al Centre is run by an organisation called the World Al Trust. They are not here purely as a zoo to entertain our visitors, although that is one of their functions. The main function is to conserve and breed endangered species of primarily owls from all over the world and release them back into the wild whenever possible. line continues through beautiful Lake District scenery along the River Mite and up to Dale Garth into the valley of Eskdale. heyday of the Eskdale Valley was during the mining boom of the last century, when iron and copper ores were found beneath the fells. Today, Upper Eskdale is a quiet place where the mountains provide sanctuary from the outside world. The various metals in the ground also attracted the Romans. They built a road into Eskdale, and to guard it, they built Hard not fought. The setting is superb, and there are views across to Scarfell and Scarfell Pike, England's highest mountain. Back at Dale Garth, Northern Rock is turned for the return to Ravenglass. Ravenglass, drinkers can watch the trains depart from the Retty Arms, while we head north over the River Mite. A few miles up the coast is Sellafield, a stark landscape where the river, rail and sea run parallel. Sellafield is British Nuclear Fuel's largest site and the area's biggest employer. Its main function is to reprocess irradiated nuclear fuel. Calder Hall, the world's first large-scale nuclear power station, started operating here in 1956, paving the way for the United Kingdom's nuclear energy program. In 1988, the Sellafield Visitor Centre opened and soon became one of the main tourist attractions in the Northwest. The exhibition is designed to explain the complexities of nuclear power and features the wider nuclear industry as well as the Sellafield site. There are working models of the plant and fuel handling machinery, as well as computer games, video presentations, cinema and seminar facilities. Visitors can also tour the site 
and special sightseeing coaches. A recent addition to the site is the 1.85 billion pound thermal oxide reprocessing plant, or THORP for short. This retrieves uranium and plutonium from the spent fuel of advanced gas-cooled and light water reactors. Spent nuclear fuel is transported to Sellafield in special flasks. Those from overseas customers arrive in purpose-built ships at BNFL's own marine terminal at Barrow Furness and are transported by rail to Sellafield. Inland at Gosforth, early Viking settlers raised a tall, slender pillar. This 10th century cross is 15 feet high and combines Christian and Nordic pagan designs. Not far away is Wasdale. Wastwater is 258 feet deep. It's England's deepest lake and at its head is England's highest mountain. Our next stop is at the small coastal village of St. Bees. The old station has been converted into a French restaurant, and the main street is fronted by buildings of character and historic interest. The village stands back from a wide sweeping bay with an open promenade and a large sandy beach. The Irish nun, St. Bega, was shipwrecked here in the 7th century. She was given shelter and the offer of land to build a sanctuary. St. Bega's Priory has a magnificent Norman doorway and for over 400 years was home to Benedictine monks. Less clear are the origins of mysterious dragon stone. Opposite the church is the famous grammar school of St. Bede's, built in the 1500s. For many years, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution has been central to village life in St. Bede's. In 1995, the village received a new lifeboat station, and the opening ceremony was performed by Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Kent. St. Bee's Head is designated a heritage coast. The 300-foot sandstone cliffs are home to one of the largest colonies of seabirds in the northwest. This is also the start of the Coast to Coast Walk, which stretches right across the north of England to the North Sea at Robin Hood's Bay. From St. Bees, the line is forced inland, following the power beck away from the mighty cliffs of St. Bees Head. Returning to the coast, the line descends into Whitehaven. 
but the main station is on the other side of a long and twisting tunnel. In the 17th century, the discovery of coal on this stretch of coast made Whitehaven a boom town. The port was one of the first planned towns in the country, and its grand Georgian buildings reflect its early importance and prosperity. Above the harbour is the candlestick chimney, now a monument to the town's mining history. To the north, the line hugs the coast. This section was built by the famous engineer George Stevenson for the Whitehaven Junction Railway. landscape becomes increasingly industrial as the line approaches Workington. Coal made the town, but it was the iron industry and shipbuilding which gave Workington world renown. 200 years ago, the docks were a center for the slave trade. Today, they harbor mainly pleasure craft. Here at Workington Hall, in 1568, Mary, Queen of Scots, spent her last night of freedom. More of the town's rich history can be explored in the Helena Thompson Museum. Lakes Express once ran from Workington to Penrith. This was a spectacular rail journey through some of the finest scenery in the Lake District. Sadly, the old Cockermouth, Keswick and Penrith Railway was closed in 1966, but the area is still well worth exploring and it's perfect for walking and cycling. Thousands of years before the railway came to Keswick, there was Castlerigg Stone Circle. There are few places as atmospheric as this. On the other side of the valley, tracks lead down from the old mines in the Skiddaw Fells.
Back at Workington, we rejoin the train and continue north, following the route of the old Maryport and Carlisle Railway. To complete the circle, we change at Carlisle. In this imposing border city, even the station is referred to as the Citadel. We're back on the West Coast Main Line, built in 1847 for the Lancaster and Carlisle Railway. Heading south, the route climbs Shap Summit before descending into the Loon Valley. Heather clad hills nurture the infant river Loon, where good fishing is indicated by the presence of herons. It has been a magnificent journey, and the final treat is the climb from Tobay up through the Haugil Fells. Mm -hmm.